Good morning, everyone. Dr. Hafner was called away for an important mission at the San Diego Comic Book Convention, so I'll be giving a guest lecture today. My name is Professor Nadelson, and we are going to be talking about finding the electric field from a line of charge. Now, I know Dr. Hafner has already shown you how to use Gauss's law uh, as a way of figuring out the electric field from a point charge, and we are going to expand on that and work with instead of the zero dimensional case of a point charge, we're now going to do a line charge and then later on in the course you're going to learn how to deal with a two dimensional sheet of charge. So a line of charge. Here is some rod or line and we'll talk about how far it extends in either direction in a moment. But the idea is that somewhere out here we're interested in the electric field produced by this line of charge. And we characterize the line of charge by a charge density, a linear charge density, lambda, which has units of coulombs per meter. So obviously, if I have twice as long a line, I have twice as much total charge. Now, what you learned when talking about Gauss's law is this idea that I can have some closed surface, and I'm going to take this closed surface, and over that surface, I'm going to perform an integral of the electric field at whatever little spot I am on the surface, dotted with a little piece of surface, and the vectorial direction is given by a little unit vector that's normal to the surface there. And if I'm able to do this integral, what Gauss's law says is that I do this integral over the whole closed surface, and this ends up equaling the enclosed charge. And to get the units right in SI units, it's the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. Now, the trick then, as Dr. Hafner has already alluded to, is that we need to figure out some clever way of picking a surface so that we can use symmetry to find the electric field without doing a whole bunch of really complicated geometry. Physicists, as I'm sure you've seen from Dr. Hafner, are just as lazy as anybody else. And what we want to do is make the problems as simple as possible. So we want to choose a geometry for our calculation that uses the symmetry of the problem. So you would not pick a surface that looks like a giant Mickey Mouse or a balloon or something strange. When you have a line of charge, there's a natural symmetry associated with this line of charge. And so it's very tempting uh, to choose a cylindrical geometry of some kind because there's cylindrical symmetry about the axis of this line of charge. So you could imagine picking some kind of a surface. In fact, I'll use a different color. You can imagine picking some kind of a surface that looks like, looks like that, where despite my crude drawing, uh, you're supposed to believe that the line of charge actually goes down the axis of the cylinder. Now, um, you can think to yourself then that the idea is we're going to somewhere pick a patch of cylinder. And so here's some little patch of cylinder up on the sort of the north, the northernmost part of this, uh, of this um, surface. And there's some unit normal associated with that piece of area. And for simplicity, I'm going to have it point up uh, because I'm really right on that top bit. And then we're going to basically figure out whatever the electric field is at this spot. And we are going to, uh, we are going to do, you know, suppose the electric field pointed like that, if that was E. And then this little yellow arrow was dA. We're going to do this over the whole surface. We're going to take E dot dA everywhere and add it all up. And, that, and, and then we will set the result of that if we're careful about keeping track of our closed surface. We have to define the ends of our cylinder, too. Uh, then we will know how much charge is enclosed, and we will, in fact, be able to do something very clever because of symmetry and basically pull the electric field out of the integral if we set our geometry up properly. And we can have an expression for the electric field as a function of position, at least the magnitude of the field. So uh, I've drawn here sort of a very general case where I'm at no, point, no particular point relative to the ends of the, of the line of charge, and so my electric field uh, doesn't necessarily point uh, nicely uh, along the same direction as dA. If we really want to deal with the finite line of charge, it's possible to do that. 
You've seen already an example with the symmet using symmetry where if you pick yourself to be in the exact center of your line of charge, you know that the electric field has to point radially outward from the line because that's the only direction in the problem, basically. That's the only symmetry direction that makes sense. Um, if we want to be really uh, lazy or we want to make a very simplifying uh, approximation, let's assume that this line of charge is infinite. Let's assume this line of charge or, or is at least extremely long compared to any other scale in the problem. So let's extend this line of charge back here to, neg to negative infinity and out here to positive infinity along, say, the x-axis. If we do that, then now uh, where we put our surface doesn't, left and right doesn't matter because wherever we are, there's an infinite amount of charge to one side and an infinite amount of charge to the other. So we're always in an isometric situation. And if we have, again, the axis of the cylinder along the same line as this line of charge, then we have a perfectly radially symmetric problem. And so wherever we are, wherever we draw some little piece of surface, the surface normal is going to point radially outward if we're on the out, that outside surface of the cylinder. And the electric field, whatever it is, is also going to point radially outward. And that's really nice and simple because it means that the E field dotted with dA uh, just becomes a, a regular product of their magnitudes. We don't have to worry about the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. We just are able to multiply the magnitude of the electric field times, in this case, one for a unit normal, times a little piece of area. So what we're going to do then is actually try and figure out how to make a closed surface. I haven't said anything about the ends, about the end caps of my cylinder. Um, we can make our cylinder whatever length we want. If we want to make, our, we want to make life simple, uh, we will just say that this distance here, this length, is some delta x. All right, And we can talk about the, uh, the surface area of the um, end caps, but we don't even have to get very fancy for this. Because we know what direction is the electric field going to be pointing if we have nice flat end caps for the cylinder, the electric field is going to be pointing radially outward from the line of charge. And our little surface normal for a little patch of area on one of these end caps is going to be pointing, in this case, in the negative x direction. If we were at the, on the other side, it would be pointing in the positive x direction. And we can just look at this and see by inspection that on the end cap, on the end cap, E dot dA is 0 because E is perpendicular to dA. So that's nice. It means we can write down our full expression for our closed surface in three pieces. We can worry about the left cap, the right cap, and the surrounding wall. And we can write it as a sum of those three terms. So let's do that. So we're going to take this integral over a closed surface and write it as a sum of integrals over patches that make up that closed surface. And so we're going to then have integral of E dot, dot dA over left end plus integral of E dot dA over the right end plus integral of E dot dA over what I will call the wall. Right? That's our full integral over the closed surface. And I, just, and I just told you that that has to end up equaling the enclosed charge divided by epsilon naught. How much charge have we enclosed? I told you we were dealing with a segment of this line that was of length delta x. So the enclosed charge. The enclosed charge over here is going to be lambda times delta x. All right, And then, of course, we've got the epsilon naught down below to get the units correct. Now, I just told you that on the end caps, on either the left or the right end cap, e dot dA is always 0 because the surface normals point along the plus or minus x axis. Uh, and the electric field points radially outward which has to be somewhere in the yz plane. So that means we can say that 
that is 0, and that is 0, and now we're just left with this piece. So let's sit at some distance r, little r, away from the axis, actually, not away from the edge of my little uh, finite diameter rod of charge, but we're going to sit some distance a little r away from the axis. So when we do that, we're going to uh, say that the electric field is basically uh, going to be, because of symmetry, since we're always the same ra radial distance away from the axis, the electric field all over this whole surface is going to have the same magnitude wherever we are. It might vary in direction. It will vary in direction because it has to point radially. But wherever we are along this whole surface, the electric field has the same magnitude. All right, and that's the thing we want to find. And again, the surface normal uh, is always going to be in the same direction as the, as the electric field. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field. We're going to evaluate this integral here. It's going to be the magnitude of the electric field, which we're able to pull out of the integral because it's constant over the whole surface, times the surface area, the total surface area, of the wall of this cylinder. And we all know what that is. That's going to basically be the circumference of the cylinder. So that's going to be 2 pi little r. Uh, that is our distance away from the axis. That's, that's the, the circumference of one hoop, if you will. And then the surface area is going to be that circumference times the length. So then we're going to have a delta x. So electric field times 2 pi r times delta x has to equal lambda times delta x over epsilon naught. And as often happens when we're clever about how we set up our, our physics problems, our surfaces in these Gauss's law problems, we find that the delta x goes away. All right? And we can, uh, it cancels out, and we can move the 2 pi r over to the other side, and then we find that the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field, the direction is always going to be radial, um, but the, the magnitude of the electric field at some distance r away from the axis, away from the line of charge, is going to basically be lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r. And that is sort of our big result that we were going for. And again, vectorially, this is a radial electric field. So if you wanted to, you could stick a vector sign here and put a little r hat, a little unit vector pointing in the r direction to give you the complete expression. Now this is nice. It shows that we can make a general, uh, a general formula. We can arrive at a general result from considering a specific case. That's also something that you'll see over and over again in this course. As physicists, we like to be able to do this. Now, we're at whatever radius we are from a uniform line of charge, we know what the electric field is. We've sort of solved the general problem. One thing, uh, two more things I want to point out, rather. One is that, as you can see, the electric field drops off as you move away from the line of charge. This makes perfect sense. You know from a point charge, the electric field drops off like 1 over r squared. Now we have, from a line charge, the electric field drops off more slowly. It drops off like 1 over r. And the other thing I wanted to point out um, is that as you get very, very close to the axis, assuming we have an infinitesimally skinny line of charge, assuming that the little diameter I drew here is actually very, very, very small, as we get very, very close to the axis, the electric field can get very, very large. Now, in a real system, if I actually had a true line of, of uniformly charged wire or something like that, this expression would obviously no longer apply once I tried to go kind of inside my wire. But for the mathematical idealization that we like to deal with, where my wire, my line of charge is infinitesimally tiny, then this works. And what you see is that the electric field actually would blow up if you got to the, to the uh, axis. So that's it. Um, I think uh, this, is, this is the main result we wanted to arrive at. And I think in future sections, you're going to learn about how to deal, for example, with a sheet of charge.